Good morning, one and all. I know it's been a long day yesterday and today again you have too many sessions to go through. So I'll try and keep, the, keep this as interesting and interactive as possible. Um, I'm not going to take you through tokens and OpenID Connect and, and OAuth 2 in detail. Uh, I'm sure you guys can read RFCs and try it out. But what I'm going to try today is tell you about what value it creates. Okay? Now, securing the value is the most important thing right, in the, in the ecosystem because if you don't generate value, why you should do this? Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, you know why people uh, use APIs in in first place and and what role it plays and sec uh, safely get into the security side of the things and how it also generates value while making things secure but not compromising experience etc. Right. Um, what I do for work is I take care of solution architecture for Forge Rock uh, for Asia and Japan uh, primarily building architecture, building a solution for customers in banking and financial and telco and government sector, uh, making sure that they materialize the value of identity in the region. Okay? Uh, and it's a big opportunity, not just as a technical person, but also for businesses. Uh, we saw some examples from James. Uh, I'm going to get into some of those details shortly. Uh, but idea today is, or, or the, the takeout from this session should be what value it really creates for you and the business and the whole ecosystem. To start with, uh, why do we need APIs? I mean, this is all about APIs. We see so many people standing literally, but why is this so important for enterprises? Apart from being a key tool, you know, for digital transformation, which is a theme, you know, as, as, as we see any business today, wants to digitally transform because of the competition, because they want to create some edge, because they want to be ahead of the curve. Uh, but APIs are the key tool for doing that digital transformation, connecting different type of systems. Uh, extracting value um, through interconnected systems, devices, things, users. But at the core of it, it's all about integrations. If you see the legacy, right? When we had to do integrations, sometimes it used, to take, it used to take weeks, months. Some systems were so difficult to integrate because of no non-standard interfaces, uh, it was very, very difficult to you know, go up and, and make changes and you know, uh, create value. Uh, in legacy times, it was data which was in rows and columns, you know, at best, in databases. But now in the world, we live with unstructured data, structured data, combination of it and whatnot. Uh, we have real-time information requirement, wherein, you know, previously it was batch process, overnight stuff, maybe sometimes, you know, once in a week, 15 days. So what you want to do nowadays is real-time. Uh, you want to have, a, you know, not just stateless model, but also state, uh, stateful model, but a combination of both is the best, right? So we, we saw in the previous section we were talking about stateless model, but there are certain transactions where you need to maintain state. Uh, so you need coexistence of stateful and stateless models. Uh, you can't just be behind the firewall, you know, you need to expose your APIs to internet where developers, partners, consumers can access them and use them. Uh, that's how you create value. And lastly, uh, Previously, it was all about client-server, right? What kind of devices we knew? Laptops, desktops, but now it's so smartphones, wearables, you know, probably IoT is picking up as we speak. So different types of devices and things. If we summarize all of these, APIs provide a possibility to integrate with any kind of data at any time from any location and provides you accessibility to any device in a matter of minutes and hours, not in weeks and months, right? So that's the reason why everybody's trying to adopt API ecosystems and build an API ecosystem to be successful and create value. At a high level, there are four areas where API ecosystem helps, right? It provides agility, as I said. Uh, it is easy to define your customer journey, your end user journeys, digital assets at different levels, at different steps, and make it simple for them to adopt. Uh, it provides personalization, right? So if, if you as a consumer prefer using mobile app, you can personalize the content of that mobile app by understanding the, the customer by means of using APIs with different type of digital assets, different type of channels, right? So combining the data from multiple channels. Provides you flexibility. Um, accessing the app components, making deliveries of services faster, uh, and also making it you know, future, future proof. So if today you are at version one, tomorrow you launch version two and three, you can coexist and you can provide versioning to APIs to make sure that it's flexible to integrate and approach. Uh, last but not the least, it provides an opportunity to generate revenue. Without revenue, why should businesses invest into API ecosystem, uh, just leave security out of it for a while, right? Why should they invest into this digital transformation initiative? Because it's an opportunity to generate revenue. Uh, 
as per a study, a single point increase in the customer experience index leads to millions of dollars of revenue, top line revenue I'm talking about. And again, independent of industries, you can see there are millions of dollars you can generate. Uh, some industries like banks and credit cards are ahead uh, because they were the early adopters of APIs and you know transformation in general. But some of them like airlines and hospitality and auto manufacturers, they are behind. For now then the opportunity is huge. Point I'm trying to make here is a single point of customer experience index increase translates into millions of dollars. Okay? Uh, as I go through my slides, you will see it's not just a particular type of industry, it's also the type of service you provide can help you generate more revenue. But with great power comes greater responsibilities, right? Securing APIs is critical. What if, if you don't do that? Facebook, the first data breach by the way, there was no data breach. There was no credential lost. Nothing happened in Cambridge Analytica where Facebook exposed any kind of credentials to anybody. It was just pure data. Problem there was the APIs had too much access. So my friend list was accessible through my access. So when I gave you a consent to use my profile to log in via Facebook, uh, you were able to access information about my circle, my friends, my family, which is not right. Primarily because the scopes and the way APIs were interacting with each other was not secured enough. Not just Facebook, you look at T-Mobile. Personal data was exposed for millions of users because the API protection was not light, rightly done. The architecture of the APIs were not secure enough. Uh, Google had to shut down one of the services because uh, it saw a big risk. And again, this risk was so big that they decided to shut down the whole service because they cannot pay GDPR equivalent penalties and they cannot you know, try and fix and put money into a business which is not generating value for them. So they had to literally take it out you know, pretty much overnight. Uh, we had USPS going through the same problem. They had lots of APIs. They realized that there is a value which they can create and integrate with ecosystem partners and create you know, better services for their customers and be agile and more fast. But at the same time, if they did not take care of the security, it became a breach issue. Lastly, obviously, Facebook again got breached. You know, this time a real breach happened and credentials were sort of made available. Uh, there are standards around API and the security and the way you can manage user access. Since you do not adopt those, what you end up doing this is uh, you, know, you, you expose credentials, you expose data. As per a study by Gartner, by 2022, API abuse will be the most frequent attack factor. Uh, this is no surprise. The amount of APIs we, we basically you know, have in our ecosystem, in our companies, is enormous. Anybody, a show of hand, knows exactly how many APIs they have in their environment, a number. Anybody can give rough estimation. There are people at the back who know it exactly. I, sh I should have a word with you at the end of the session. But it's very difficult to predict how many APIs you're really having in the system. So what is required is essentially a sound approach to securing APIs. It's very difficult to control the number of APIs as they outgrow. We, we just saw with uh, MyInfo as an example. In 2016-17, they had some 100K transactions. In 18, it scaled up to tens of millions of transactions. Because the adoption will be very fast. When you open it up to your developers and partners, anybody can pretty much come and ask for a, you know, API access and start using the ecosystem. OCBC, DBS, all these banks have public APIs. So the amount of requests that can come and hit you can be huge. And that also exposes you in a way, right? Because your uh, threat surface and threat actors would be different in this kind of scenarios. So what should be our approach? We believe at Forgerock that it's going to be digital identity as the base. Now most of the breaches you saw on the previous slide, what was really compromised? It was the data of the end customer. It was data related to their identity, their likings, their preferences, their social circle, which was basically used for erroneous things, right? For, for malicious activities or for uh, political gains in some scenarios. So if you understand your digital identity and you take an identity-driven approach in securing your API ecosystem, the amount of value you generate as well as the security you get is, is, is tremendous. Let me explain, you that, uh, explain that uh, to you in four terms. Customer experience and expectation. Now, when I log into my mobile application today, I hate typing in passwords because it's too difficult. And especially if you have big thumbs, it's difficult to type, right? Uh, what do I prefer is somebody should send me a push notification because I'm using a smart device which is capable of an Android swipe or an iOS push authentication mechanism which makes it easy for me to log in, okay? Can also be used uh, as, a, as a factor of making my digital journey simple and less frictionful. Secondly, uh, cybersecurity. 
Again, the same example, if you're using, say, push authentication, you're not compromising security. You're, in fact, making it much secure than using simple passwords, which are difficult to remember. People tend to write them somewhere or store them in clear text somewhere, right? You're using native functionalities of providers, which is very, very secure, and at the same time is using factors like biometrics to essentially authenticate you as an individual. You're tying back to the identity of the user with the device as well. That has its own value, which I'm going to come to shortly. Uh, thirdly, digital transformation, we said APIs are the key tool of digital transformation. If you combine digital identity as a building block across your API ecosystem, what you can generate is products and services which are so customer oriented and so personalized that people will really love to use them. Okay? Not just any mere you know, mobile app or a web app which has been transformed from legacy system to new systems. Lastly, there are laws and regulations which really tell you, like G likes of GDPR and PSD2, where you have to make sure that you protect the information, you make sure that the end user has uh, the right to be forgotten, has given their consent uh, to share that information for, uh, for usage of whatever they prefer. Not everything, right? At the same time, if, if you are distributing that information to your partner ecosystem, you should know where you have given it. And if somebody says that you need to call it back or you know, mask it out or not use it, from here on, you should be able to do that. So there are regulations which are also telling us to do so. Uh, so the total value, if I were to calculate, of these four themes itself is so enormous. If we drill down into the customer expectation part of the things, right? Uh, we saw Mindfo is the best possible EKYC solution I've seen for a long while, where you can be onboarded in a matter of minutes. Uh, the customers today, you know, when they want to sign up for a service, they do not want to fill up forms, they do not want to give you too much information. They prefer the likes of social sign-on and social registration, and best is things like EKYC done by MyInfo, where in a single click and a single consent, you are able to share whatever a bank needs or an insurance company needs or a, or a vehicle provider needs to open an account for you or to give you a loan or to give you a, a credit card, right? Simple yet secure uh, with my consent as a consumer is, is the theme. So you need to find me, you need to provide me the right offerings, right solution. You need to ask me, consent me before you, know, you take my data and start using it for business purposes. You need to protect it, obviously. You know, the likes of PDPA in Singapore is, 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 is a rule, is a regulation for us. But at the same time, when I trust you to give my information, I expect you to protect it and probably reuse it for better offerings to me, but do not distribute it to other partners or ecosystem without my consent. Uh, advise me, you know, as I start becoming, you know, a consumer and start using services, I want you to advise me based on my usage patterns, my, my, my likings, my dislikings, uh, and alert me when there is something better happening with me or if there is a fraud actually happening with my account, I should be alerted, right? Most of the banks today, especially in Singapore, if we see, they alert you whenever there is a transaction done. But is there a better way to enhance that experience for the end consumer? Sometimes I do not have access to my SMS because I'm traveling, I'm on roaming. How do you better inform me that there's something transac some transaction happening on my behalf which can be fraudulent? All these things deliver a consistent, seamless, and secure customer experience. And by the way, this is a baseline now. This is not a um, you know, optional thing, this is a must do for any business who is digital native. We talked about uh, regulatory uh, frameworks, you know, coming up in action. Uh, apart from GDPR and PSD2, open banking is another theme where you see digital identity is the building block which is being used while you, you know, you provide your APIs to the fintechs or, or banks are talking to each other, providing financial planning related information or better services. They need to follow a regulatory framework and API exposure which follows digital identity as a building block to secure things. Now, for any ecosystem to develop, it's a journey, right? It doesn't happen overnight. Um, we are in an era where some companies or some organizations are laid back. They are trying to adopt to new structures. Uh, so the challenge to them is how should they go about you know, this journey? Now, obviously, first and foremost, you need to look at your internal systems because that's in your control. Um, you focus on trying create API infrastructure around that internal ecosystem which you've invested in for years. Now, obviously, you cannot throw it out overnight, right? You've got to reuse it. So you need to restify it, create API architecture around that internal ecosystem. Uh, then you need to look at a you know, platform approach wherein what, while you are taking care of your internal infrastructure and uh, exposing APIs around that, you also create a platform which can be scaled and can be futuristic. Uh, and third is where you become an ecosystem. You open up to the external party, third parties, uh, ecosystem providers to integrate and start using things. Now, each wave delivers new set of capabilities, no doubt, but there are challenges established around uh, operating model, 
uh, how you're going to deploy things, how you're going to evolve in future. That's where I'm going to take you to in uh, some of the approach, architectural approach and security best practices uh, here on. Um, one of the major challenges when you grow from a you know internal focused organization and API infrastructure to all the way an ecosystem which is which has got a, a north south exposure uh, to the consumers devices and things various types of channels different types of actors different types of third party providers um, you might be also integrating with the likes of you know SaaS providers or platform as a service providers or hosting your infrastructure and APIs into uh, cloud providers likes of AWS Azure and Google. Um, and again, not to mention open banking and those related standards which mandate some of the banks and some of the industries to, f to regulate APIs and protect them. On the east-west side of the things, you have your business-to-business -business integration with uh, you know, your business partnerships or, or, or intra-intercompany uh, integrations. You have your product integrations using you know, the, the known or well-known API gateways. The, po the point I'm trying to make here is if you look north-south and east-west, you have to look at few common things. The perimeter is completely diminished, right? There's no perimeter here. Uh, I cannot have defense in depth as a single way of protecting my uh, infrastructure, my APIs. You need to look at it from an identity uh, aware, you know, kind of contextual perspective. You need to make sure that whatever you build, you know, to protect your APIs has to be scalable because, um, you know, as per a study, there will be six devices per user by 2020. Okay, today we already have three fours usually, like laptop, uh, smartphone, wearables, a personal laptop or a personal phone, right? So already four or five devices. By 2020, you will have six devices. And if you do not have a perimeter and you're exposing everything over internet, pretty much I can come through my personal laptop, my professional laptop, my personal mobile, wherever and whatnot. So whatever you do has to scale, scale to that kind of uh, you know, requirements, especially in Asia because of the population. But at the same time, you got to make sure that whatever APIs we are exposing, are working on standard interfaces. The standards like OAuth to OpenID Connect and the, and the latest standards around user managed access are where these things can be secured and without um, you know, breaching the trust of your end user and end partners. While building the API security, there are certain building blocks, right? some basics which has to be in place. Uh, the biggest question, right, and, and on, on the right you see a traditional, you know, logical architecture of an API enabled, uh, you know, uh, company or a, an organization where you have an API gateway which is protecting access to your internal APIs and integrating with your third party SaaS based system, etc. But what you need to bring in is, uh, you need to bring in digital structure or journeys, how you're going to enroll your customers, how you're going to protect them around you know fraud uh, detect behavioral patterns um, by means of adaptive authentication or security based on adapt adaptive risk mechanisms and and step up and step down depending on the situation and the transaction they are doing you got to also provide access control on who can come and register right in standards like OAuth 2 you can come and dynamic register your endpoints as a client uh, but at the same time you need to gatekeep that and make sure that when somebody is onboarded they are the right kind of client who are allowed to access your APIs and there is a security mechanism in place. Uh, nowadays with, with the latest you know, uh, draft on OAuth 2, there is a mutual uh, authentication using PKI certificates, uh, which again, you know, Mindfo and all have done out of the band, uh, can be done you know, using standards. Lastly, uh, because it's about customers or citizens using your infrastructure end of the day, as a consumer, you got to create self-service for them so that they can come, they can reset their multi-factor options, they can reset their passwords, update their profiles, etc. cetera. Um, all together, you need to take care of access management and authorization, both internally and externally, uh, while you are building the API security ecosystem. Second thing, security in general. Now, defense in depth has its position, right? You need to have anti-DDoS solution in place, you need to have uh, web application firewall, firewalls in place, you need to have the PKI SSL on, uh, offloading uh, clear text conversion in place at points because without that you cannot perform. So you got to balance out the security with the, the performance at certain levels. You got to invest into some technologies which takes care of you know, uh, anti-DDoS or anti-bot kind of behaviors. But at the same time, you got to prevent the data exfiltration and fraud, which can only be tied up if you tie up the identity of the end user, look at the context, and tie them back into the overall security posture you're implementing. Uh, protecting the information in transit, again, we have been doing this for ages, right? We encrypt data, we sign data to make sure that the confidentiality, integrity is taken care of. We got to continue doing that. 
Thirdly, uh, there is API management. Uh, API gateways by function are there to manage APIs, throttle and control how much uh, in intake is allowed and how much data can be exposed. So security should be decoupled out of those API gateways, in my opinion, because if they start doing security also, and you have scales like tens of millions of uh, you know usage of your platform, an API gateway's performance gets impacted. So if you decouple the security from an API gateway, API gateway function as a API management product and takes care of the performance of APIs and the data which gets exposed, and the security part of the things takes care of you know the token generation revalidation of token, introspection of tokens, and reminting of tokens whenever required. Um, you can also, also throttle the traffic using API uh, gateways. Now, API gateways are very good at throttling, but at the same time, you've got to make sure that the experience, end user experience is sort of breaking down, broken down in some cases. If there is a, a latency or a delay in providing service, they should be you know, given right kind of messages. A good example is what you know, we see when Singtel launches a new iPhone, for example, right? Uh, the day you are given a token where you have to go and start registering for the iPhone, what they do is they break down the whole process into multiple steps. So step one is you key in fin, uh, your FIN information, then you wait for another 30 seconds or 40 seconds, then you go to the next step. Behind the scenes, what they are doing is they are queuing you. So there is a queue mechanism in place, and the API gateway is throttling and monitoring that session itself before you get to the page where you actually get to sign up for your device. So you've got to break down the journey. Uh, access control, obviously, you know, that's where I think the security element comes into action again. You go to validate tokens, especially, you know, if you're using refresh tokens. Uh, as my friend before this session said, refresh tokens can be really scary uh, because if they fall into wrong hands or if they are exposed, they can cause a lot of nuisance, right? So you got to make sure that the access control and the, the frequency by which you issue access tokens and refresh tokens is controlled, is monitored, and is, is introspected and blacklisted on the authorization server side. Another building block, and again, this is more from an architectural perspective. Um, as we see more people ap adopt microservices, just APIs, they need to make sure that when they are uh, building those microservices-based architecture using, say, DevOps and containerization in general, they build concepts around where and how they want to build security. Um, there, there is always a debate between the, the IT guy and the security guy, right? That IT guy wants to make it performant, Security guy wants to make it more and more secure, but what happens is it becomes slow, right? You don't want it to be slow. So what you need to do in the uh, microservices architecture-based uh, you know, approach is you've got to break down. You've got to classify your APIs, your microservices. Some microservices, some APIs do not require high level of authentication and, and protection. They could be classified into low level of uh, you know, classification of security where you are okay once uh, uh, access token is presented, you don't need to introspect it, you don't need to really validate everything inside the token and allow access. Wherein some of them could be mid-range, right? Where there is a possibility that if a step up does not happen from a user's perspective, right? So if I'm not challenged to uh, log in using my voice or biometric, the transaction which happens with those microservices and API could be related to payment, could be related to transaction commits, right? Behind the scenes which if not introspected properly could lead to you know fraud or other kind of problems so there you need to make sure that some sort of introspection is in place may not be very high level of introspection but probably a check with the edge uh, gateway to validate the token and the, and the and the and the and the scopes and the audience and how long it can be used whereas in the third type where you really need to you know completely introspect every single aspect right from scopes audience uh, and, and the validity of the time till the access token can be used, uh, or it should be reissued for a particular transaction only. Those type of microservices and APIs, you're better off using a step up authentication followed by a reminting of a special purpose token, which can only be used by a specific microservice API. So see, we have a whole range of possibilities, right? Right from a general uh, purpose access token, which is to everybody, every microservice, every API, all the way to specific purpose transaction-based tokens. Now, there has to be a trade-off between performance and security. Uh, I'm a big fan of performance, but I would not want to compromise security. So you've got to take a balanced approach. You've got to make sure where you need to introspect tokens, where you do not need to introspect token, where it is making sense to really mint a new token rather than using an existing one, which is probably a read-only token for some purposes, right? So we've got to take a balanced approach. 
if we combine all those uh, approaches and summarize with the digital identity approach of securing and creating value, there are certain things we have to do. Uh, obviously, we have to use APIs, no, no, no brainer there, inside out. Uh, we have to deliver better and seamless customer experience because without that, the uptake will not be there. And if there is no uptake, there is no business, why do it? Uh, thirdly, uh, the most efficient instrument for adopting the new rules, uh, new rules of the game are APIs, right? But you've got to make it simple. Um, allows enterprises to transform to more digitalized entities. Now again, uh, irrespective of the channel, we did not discuss channels in detail, but you have to see mobile, web, devices, things, uh, community to community, user to user, service to service. There are so many different possible channels through which the same thing is going to happen. Asking for an API access, expecting some payload back, uh, asking for a transactional information and a, a uh, expecting a response back. If you do not tie back the identity, the digital identity of user device or things, how are you going to distinguish between them? Uh, so combining that provides us an ability to provide security and privacy. Scale, obviously, because then you can take care of multiple transactions, multiple types of APIs in a secured fashion while monetizing the whole ecosystem and providing value to everybody, not just customer, but to the businesses as well. From a business benefit perspective, uh, if the slide loads, um, what we have tried to understand is using standards approach and security with APIs, we can minimize risk following the standards and adhering to the uh, standards likes of GDPR, PSD2, and, and open banking. Uh, we can have cost benefit wherein what we have done is we have made systems faster to deploy and spin off using containerization and DevOps and APIs in general. Uh, so the time to market or time it takes to launch a functionality is very, very fast. Uh, we can build on existing infrastructure, we can build new versions of the APIs and provide better functionalities. And lastly, we can grow business. If you understand your customer better, if you can meet their expectations and provide personalized experience irrespective of the channel they come through, you tend to get more uh, you know, uh, revenue generation. We saw an example of OCBC leveraging my info based KYC process, where what they saw was the digital uptake of account opening was 3x. The amount of people who wanted to do transaction with them automatically increases, right? That's because it's easy, it's simple. They don't need to provide 15 different papers, scan them, email to somebody, and somebody has to read it, and then key into the system. It, it gets done in 30 seconds when I give the consent. So the whole business benefit of using the API ecosystem uh, comes into play. Uh, lastly, what do we do um, as, as a company? We provide secure, secure frictionless authentication by means of intelligent authentication mechanism based on trees. Uh, and that's where I wanted to take the question of voice. Voice is a form of authentication. Uh, the API access and the security only understands the token side of the thing, which comes after the authentication has taken place, right? So if you want to combine, say, a voice-based authentication and in general, any kind of biometric authentication, that will be a form of uh, authentication factor, not related to OAuth through an OpenID Connect. That's secondary, right? First, you need to authenticate. And again, as an ecosystem, uh, you, need a, you need a centralized security you know, platform which can understand for what transaction they need to step up and start calling these voice APIs or biometric APIs without causing any kind of friction. We provide rich authorization capabilities around identity relationships. As I said, single individual has six different devices. So Ajay Biani using his wearable, Ajay Biani using his mobile or coming through his laptop, it's the same human identity. If you can relate it better, you can provide better personalization in terms of service. Uh, uh, I usually joke about this. If I'm an Apple uh, laptop user, what's the point of sending me an email or an SMS saying, buy a Windows laptop. I'm not going to do that because I don't like Windows laptops. I'm a Mac user. I would prefer a credit card offer or a banking offer which tells me, hey Ajay, we understand you're a Mac user and would you like to buy the new Mac which is just out in the, uh, in the market using a credit card and here you can convert into an EMI. That's the value proposition I'm looking for as a consumer. So personalizing, uh, understanding the identity relationship before you position any kind of offerings to me. Uh, modern a a a API integrations, application integration in general, you know, the world has changed, single page applications, REST, REST API based integration is the, is the new thing. Uh, we have gone a step further. We've already built platform around integrating with microservices, gateway and IoT enabled devices and edge softwares. Um, we have built a platform for IoT scale. Uh, we, have, we have customers who run hundreds of millions of identities, devices and things with our platform. And obviously, we, we have adopted and we have embraced ourselves the, the DevOps way of doing things. The whole platform is made to be deployed using the likes of Kubernetes, 
irrespective of the cloud provider you use or any kind of you know uh, standard Kubernetes implementation uh, you must be using with the likes of OpenShift. Uh, with that, guys, uh, I want to give back some time to you for some questions. Uh, here's my email address, and you can scan the QR code to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, but any questions, I would like to take it. Yes, please. Yeah. Cheers. APIs in the US economy, right? Yeah. So um, my question is, how do you actually get this um, value? Like, like mm -hmm. coming back to the point of your presentation, it's to secure value in mm -hmm. the API ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? So how do you actually get that, that um, amount? How do you actually come up with the figures of yeah. the value uh, of the API? Very good question. Uh, look, there's no standard figure which you can determine, right? But I can give you some basic examples. So to me, value is three components. One is how much revenue you generate for somebody, how much cost you save for somebody, and how much risk you have reduced for somebody. And irrespective of any business, these are the three key tenets how you de determine a quantitative value, right? So say, for example, if you're under GDPR, right? If you're going to be charged 4% of your revenue, if you get breached, that is a number you can start with. So you can look at your top line revenue under GDPR if you are catering to European citizens or you are operating out of Europe, you can take 4% as your revenue as a risk which you will get into if you do not secure it properly. Uh, in terms of generating um, uh, revenue, top line revenue, right? There are some data points available in the market, like those reports which I've shown, wherein based on industry, if an increase of one customer experience index point translate into how much revenue, those data points are available, and I'm okay to share these slides with you guys. There are other reports available where you can pick up data points, right? Um, we have something called as customer value management, where we work with customers, go in their environment, and determined if they could do smarter marketing, right? Uh, say, and, uh, and that basically helps them generate one more percent of uh, revenue. That is the number you can start with. In terms of infrastructural cost, uh, probably it's very, it's, it's very straightforward, right? You can look at your legacy infrastructure, determine what cost you really run on. But if you were to translate that into you know, a DevOps way of deploying things and how much bill you will pay to a, a cloud provider um, using benchmarks, which we provide as a, as a platform company, you can determine some, some some dollar values to determine the total value which it creates for you as a company. That would be a starting point. Yeah. Any more questions? More time for one more question. Uh, yeah, one more, I, I think. Where? Anybody? Oh, okay, sorry, I thought someone. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank Cheers. you.